Welcome back to ECE 441A, 541A. Homework number six is due on Monday. And we have no class a week from today. That's Veterans Day. Homework number seven is due a week from next Wednesday. And the third exam is actually two weeks from today. Lab number three is due on a Wednesday. I believe that's the last day of class. And if you're in 541, your project deliverables, which you have three, the first of those is due on the 21st of November. And that's really to tell me what you're planning to do for your project. And then deliverable two is due on the last day of class. What I want to do today is try to finish up with the root locus construction rules. I'm not sure we will make it, but oh, where did I have? I thought I had another announcement. Maybe not. Oh, I missed it. I jumped it. So between homework number six and no class, there's an additional lecture that I've now posted. And it's which root locus diagram is it? You could basically have many different possible diagrams depending on how the poles and zeros are positioned relative to each other. In terms of you might have the same structure of poles and zeros, but their spacing may actually influence one diagram versus another. And I talk about that and how you can actually use rule number four to determine which of these diagrams you might have. And that's concerned with relative min and relative max along the real axis. And you can use that graph or that concept to determine which root locus pattern you have given a given set of poles and zeros. Today what I want to do is try to finish up the root locus construction rules. There are root locus examples. If you go to table 9.3, which we can turn to right now, maybe. This is, so table 9.3 is spread out on multiple pages. And the right column, or the next to the right column, contains root locus diagrams. And I've now indicated the particular transfer function, which is on the far left side, but it's easier to compress if I just reintroduce the transfer function near the root locus diagram. But this gives you a quick visual of different pole zero patterns and their respective shapes as far as the root locus diagram. And they give you 15 of those examples, and that might give you a feel for what you might expect for different pole zero patterns. And there's actually a mistake on like the third page of these. And I've now indicated this on this version of table 9.3. But they talk about a triple pole. And they get that one mixed up with G9. So you can see the ordering is messed up in terms of linear order. But just know that if you do have three poles at the origin, it's going to be three integrators, pure integrators. And it's going to look like that triple pole pattern where you're going off at 60 degrees, 180, and 300 degrees immediately from the poles. You have no need to worry about considering or calculating the centroid for that particular pole pattern. And it's slightly different if you have two poles at the origin and a real pole a little bit to the left or on the left-hand side. Again, those two poles are going to move off of the real axis immediately because there's no root locus segment or root locus piece on the real line segments on either side of the origin in that case because we have an even number of poles at one location. And if you want to see some of these patterns, that's where I would recommend that you go. You can also find potential help through MATLAB. And there's a few commands within MATLAB that you can use 
our locus will immediately plot the root locus for a given system. And here I've simply given you a hypothetical system that has a real zero at minus three, a pole at the origin, and a pole at minus one. And you should already know what that looks like as far as a root locus. But if you want to check your work, the answer is not in the back of the book, but it's in MATLAB. You can now just plug in the transfer function, issue the command R locus with the system in the argument, and it will sketch the root locus pattern for you. If you wanted to find a particular gain value along the root locus, R locus find will allow you to position the cursor and click your mouse, and it will tell you what the gain is at a particular location on your root locus diagram. And if you want to see how a root locus pattern, if you adjust the pole locations on those paths, influence a time response behavior, you might try R locus tool, RL tool, with an argument or not. If you don't issue the argument, you can then, once it opens up this tool, you can start entering your system and, and controller transfer functions and it will start incorporating those into whatever you're after or interested in looking at in terms of a root locus. Here again are the root locus rules, one through six, and you may or may not need all of those given a particular pattern of poles and zeros, the starting and ending points, the segments of the real line that are on the root locus, the asymptotic behavior, what are your angles, and it's all based on that fundamental angle, which is 180 degrees divided by your pole zero excess. That's quick to find. You can quickly find your pole zero excess. The breakaway and reentry points, that's a little bit more involved, but it all just involves trying to determine what's K look like along the line segment that you're interested in examining for either a re-entry or a breakaway point. And do you have a relative minimum or a relative maximum respectively on that real line segment? Today what we want to do really hinges on the phase angle condition in both rules. The first one is the imaginary axis crossing. Do, do these poles and zeros contribute a phase angle individually when taken together, do they sum up to minus 180 degrees? And if you simply had to find or compute the angle of this transfer function, you now have the zeros upstairs, the zero factors and their respective angles, and you have the pole factors downstairs, you're now taking for each factor, you're looking at maybe we have a zero, we'd find its angle to a particular point, and in this case, it's on the imaginary axis, and we subtract the pole angle since they're downstairs. It's just how you combine angles if you have a complex number for your zero factor or pole factor, maybe written in polar form, you now have the zero angles minus the pole angles. And those then algebraically combine to give you some value and you're trying to determine at a given location on the imaginary axis, does that angle equal minus 180 degrees? Because we know that all points on the root locus have to have an angle of minus 180. If they don't, if that S-plane location is not, does not contribute an angle or does not have an angle of minus 180, that point on the S-plane does not live on the root locus for that collection of poles and zeros. The angles of arrival and departure are similarly related to the phase angle. Here is rule number five. It's branches of the root locus cross the imaginary axis if the phase angle condition is satisfied. That just means is the angle equal to minus 180. And there's a couple of ways to do that. You could compute the angles from the zeros and the poles and algebraically combine those and see if at a given location on the imaginary axis those angles equal minus 180. That's sort of a trial and error, is it not? You could have a thousand points that you're checking. 
probably don't want to do that necessarily. If your transfer function is not too complicated, you could actually generate the Ruth array. And what do you know about the S1 row? If you force that to equal zero, then you know you have symmetry about the origin. And you could now use that gain value that you determined to force the S1 row to zero to determine where are your symmetry values on the imaginary axis in the S2 row. We'll go through those examples now with an example. But here's a picture. And I wanted to do this ahead of time because I knew it would maybe I wouldn't draw it very accurately if I was doing it live. So here is approach number one for an arbitrary three-pole system. And it's all poles, but if you had zeros, you would have to add those zero contributions in as well. In this particular transfer function of g of s, h of s, I'm only saying it now, or I'm considering the case where it has three poles. One's at minus p1, another one's at minus p2, and another one's at minus p sub 3. What I'm wanting you to become very comfortable with, and this is why you might have to have a protractor, is you could quickly measure these angles with a protractor if you sketched your diagram accurately, meaning you had your x-axis the same units as the y-axis so that you have consistent angles or meaningful angles. If you were interested, does that blue dot, is it actually going to be on the root locus? You would then find all three of those angles to that dot. You would find theta sub p1, and theta sub p1 is just the inverse tangent of the vertical distance over the horizontal distance. That's why we learned our trig. Theta p2 is similar. It has exactly the same vertical distance, a different horizontal distance. And you can, if you sketch this fairly well, you can eyeball those angles and fairly quickly determine, do those three actually sum up to minus 180? And we're obviously, in this case, we have no zeros. We're summing the zeros minus the sum of the poles. We have minus theta p1, minus theta p2, minus theta p3. And we want to know, is that now going to give us or result in an angle of minus 180? Let's look at an example. Suppose we have p1, p2, and p3 at 1, 2, and, three, and, one, two, and 4, respectively just to be difficult. I didn't want to make it that uniform. And suppose we make omega sub x. Maybe that was a poor choice, since that's one of the pole values. But let's say that omega sub x, on the imaginary axis, let's say we want to see at j4, what are the angles due to the pole at minus 1, due to the angle, or due to the pole at minus 2, and the angle at minus 4? You could eyeball those with your protractor. You could actually compute those. And in this particular case, we are pretty close to minus 180 for those three poles. We came out at minus 184. Then you could say, well, where does it? the root locus really cross. If I go down, is my angle going to get closer to minus 180? Or if I go up, is it going to get closer? And you could adjust that 4 value up or down to determine where you might cross the imaginary axis with your root locus. You know for those for this particular system that you are going to cross the imaginary axis, do you not? Why do you know that? Here we, what's my pole zero excess? I have three poles, no zeros. My pole zero excess is three. What's my fundamental angle in the asymptote? 60. It's 180 divided by 3. I have an angle of 60 degrees, and my branch is going to approach that for high k. Well, that angle eventually is going to go into the right half plane no matter where sigma sub a is, wherever the centroid is. And the centroid is going to be probably 
located between P2 and P4, or P2 and P3. sub And you know then that a branch is eventually going to go into the imaginary, or into the right half plane and cross the imaginary axis. You have another asymptote at 300. So you have those two branches going off. You really only need one pole in the right half plane to spoil things for stability purposes. Let's do it the other way. Let's do approach number two, which is to use the Ruth array. Suppose we are doing that for this particular example. If we do, that's our G of S. Our denominator in the closed loop transfer function is 1 plus K G of S. And in this particular case, it's 1 plus K over those three factors. The characteristic equation arises from the numerator of that denominator. Is that clear? Meaning if we put 1 plus k over this factor, over a common denominator of those three factors, this 1 now becomes those three factors divided by those three factors. And the numerator then of this denominator expression is our characteristic equation, and that's those three factors plus that n original numerator, which in this case was just a gain, k. Is it clear where that characteristic equation is coming from? This is now what influences our closed loop poles. And as we adjust this dial k, how do these closed loop poles move around in the complex S plane? That's what the root locus tells us. But in this case, we are trying to find the value of the imaginary axis crossing. So let's do that with the root array. In this case, if you multiply out these three factors, hopefully you will get s cubed plus 7s squared plus 14s plus 8, and then you have to remember to do the plus k. And now what we are trying to do is build the root array, force our s1 row to 0, by the choice of k, if we do that, we've now produced symmetry in, with respect to the origin in the S2 row, and we can use that k value to determine what that is. Getting a lot of blank stares. Let's build the Ruth array. We know how to do that. Here's S cubed, S squared. This is my bookkeeping. What's in my first row of the Ruth array? <coughs> okay, I just wanted to make sure you were with me here. You were acting like you weren't before. I think you're just playing with me. So now we have 1 and 14. What's in the second row? eight plus k or k plus, k plus eight, however you want to write that, it's the same if it's easier for you to write one way or another. What's in my S1 row? And I want to force that S1 row to 0. Does it really matter what my denominator? It's positive, so it's OK. I can multiply out, and that I don't need to worry about my denominator. So I really only am concerned with my numerator. What's the S0 row? Not that it matters. That just falls down from the S2 <coughs> row, doesn't it? So if I now force my S1 row to 0, And the reason I'm doing that is to force symmetry among my roots. I need that if I'm crossing the imaginary axis because I'm going to have those occurring in complex conjugate pairs. If I set S1 row equal to 0, I now have 7 times 14 minus 8 minus k equaling 0. Or I now have k is equal to 
7 times 14 minus 8. I don't have a calculator. So now I have I have my answer. Sorry, it's Friday morning. I don't want to think too hard. So I just did a little algebra. So now I have k equal to 90. What's that give me? So what? What does that mean? It means k is 90, but why is that important? I have this dial. Okay, so this 90 is a sweet spot, isn't it? If k is 0, where are my poles in this system? Where are my closed loop poles for this particular example? If k is equal to 0. If k is equal to 0, what are the roots of this characteristic equation that's in the middle of the screen? Minus 1, minus 2, and minus 4. Those are our open loop poles. That's what k equals 0 gives us, right? <laughs> So we're stable for k equals 0. Now we adjust k, and what's going to happen? Can you envision what the root locus looks like for this pattern? What segments of my real axis are on the root locus? Between minus p1 and minus p2 is a segment, and to the left of minus p3. Meaning, as I crank up the gain k from 0, the p1 pole goes left, the p2 pole goes right, so I'm staying stable for a while, am I not? And as I crank up the gain k, what's going to happen to p1 and p2? They're going to come together and they're going to break away. When, what do they do once they break away? So my gain is getting bigger. I know it's not up to 90 yet, do I not know that? What happens at 90? 90 is where they cross the imaginary axis. They're going to break away and approach those asymptotes at 60 and 300. And 90 is then the upper bound on stability for this particular system. We would want to keep gain k less than 90 in order to preserve stability. But right at 90, we have the S1 row equal to 0, which gives us symmetry. And once we have symmetry, we can go to the S2 row and say, for that value of k, where are my symmetric roots? S2 row says I have 7 S squared plus 8 plus k equal to 0. Or I now have, for this particular choice of k, and 98 is 7 times 14, so I can now f divide out the 7, and I end up with s squared plus 14 equaling 0. Or s is now equal to plus and minus j, the square root of 14. And that, if you do have a calculator, is 3.74. Or a slide rule. So if you don't have a calculator with a square root function, you can estimate that. You know it's between the square root of 16 and the square root of 9. So you know it's between 3 and 4. Sometimes you're just doing this on the back of an envelope at your convenience because you're interested in finding these asymptotes and, I'm sorry, these imaginary axis crossings. You now know that they crossed at 3.74 and in our particular diagram, what does that tell us? Now we can actually draw a pretty nice, I guess nice is relative. You may not think any of these are nice. But here is our root locus starting. 
we go here and then there, that one goes off. If we wanted to use rule three, we could find phi sub a, that's 60, 180, and 300. We could find sigma sub a. What is sigma sub a? It's not too hard to calculate, maybe. Sigma sub a from rule three is minus one, minus two, minus four, minus the zeros, and we don't have any zeros, divided by, well, let me not even put anything in there since I don't have anything, the pole zero excess. Or this is now minus 7 over 3, which is a third beyond minus 2. So our sigma sub a is right here. And if we compute, this is now an angle of 60 degrees, which puts us about right there. And we could compute the breakaway if we wanted to, but if this was a quick sketch, we know the breakaway is occurring between those two. And we just computed that we're going to cross at 3.7 and it's symmetric. This is now coming down here at 3.7 and that's going towards that asymptote. Are there questions on rule number five? How to find and what did we do? We actually said let's look at the angle at J4 and it was minus 184 using approach number one. So if we would have come down a little bit in our imaginary axis to 3.74, that's what this is supposed to be. This is omega equal 3.74 with k equal, what, what's the value of k? That was 90. Now we know quite a bit about this system. We know that we can adjust that gain k from 0 to 90 before we go unstable. And if we wanted to, we could say, you know what, I want to have a particular angle of my complex poles. Maybe I wanted an angle of 45 degrees for my complex poles. Then I could say, let me go to an angle of 45 and I want to crank up the gain to get me to that particular point. I know that's possible because it's on the root locus and the root locus tells us where our closed loop poles are. Yes? So when we were looking, the question was when we were doing the Ruth array, why did I ignore the S0 row? We know we want to be stable initially, and that's going to be stable as long as 8 plus k is greater than 0, right? That's kind of a non piece of information for what we were using the Ruth array for at this point. We were saying we want to find the value of gain k that forces our S1 row to 0. We want symmetry. We want to keep cranking that gain up until we get right to the stability boundary. So we really weren't worried about what's happening in the S0 row. But for k equal 90, this is OK. For k equal 0, this is OK. And that's where we're starting. So this S0 row is going to be positive and remain positive for all positive values of k. The S1 row is different. Question? The question was, what were you doing here? <laughs> what, what does minus 184 mean? And how do I use that, maybe, is one way of paraphrasing the question. Th that minus 184 resulted from this particular pattern of poles, minus 1, minus 2, and minus 4. We were trying to determine where does 
the root locus actually crossed the imaginary axis. And so mentally, I had already sketched the root locus pattern somewhat for this collection of poles. And we just did it. So we know that the two poles between minus P1 and minus P2, those branches are going to come together and break away. And what we were trying to do is determine where those branches are going to cross the imaginary axis. We know that if the point is on the root locus, the phase of these three poles has to equal minus 180. So we were just walking up the imaginary axis and computing the phase angle for all of those points. And if we really wanted to, we could have fun on a Friday evening. We could say, oh, what's the phase at 1, J1? What's the phase at J2? We could just walk up the imaginary axis and plug in 1 for omega sub x and 2. And what we did is we plugged in 4. And we went a little bit beyond where it really would have crossed the imaginary axis because in this case, we had an angle of minus 184. So if we step down to J3.7, then all of these angles, if we now use omega sub x, wherever that is, in this formula of 3.7, that will give us something very close to minus 180. Is that helping? You can see that that's an iterative approach, but typically we're not, unless I ask you, sometimes, and here's where I could throw you a little bit of a change up relative to a question. I might say not where does the root locus cross the imaginary axis, but where do the asymptotes cross the imaginary axis? That would be a much quicker question to answer, would it not? You would just have to compute sigma sub a, and then you know it's at 60 degrees. You just have to do some trigonometry and find that vertical distance. In this case, it's a little bit above 4. You would have this x distance, or sigma sub a, times tangent of 60, and that will give you your vertical height, where your asymptote crosses the imaginary axis, which is different from where your root locus crosses your imaginary axis. So read the question carefully. The asymptote crossing is an easier or a less involved calculation, obviously, than where does the root locus actually cross the imaginary axis. Do you see the, but if the asymptote is crossing a little bit beyond four. Do you see that that's pretty close? You're in the ballpark. I'm using a lot of baseball terms here. Change up, ballpark. Let's swing for the fences and start with rule number six in a minute. But I thought I saw a question. So now you could sketch, let's say that you've now drawn a root locus that you think is correct, and some, I don't think that's your question. I don't know, I was saying that, you know, the way you set up the, I mean, find the estimate 184 degree, you could have, uh, you could have made a function out of the thing, you know, you find the, Yes, yeah, so you could, I think the question is, could you not find the answer to this particular expression if you left for a variable and called it omega? So you could do that, and if you have a calculator, maybe that's easy to do. You could now, you could even plot this, and I think I did that yesterday. I have a life, don't I? So. <laughs> You can plot that inverse tangent formula for different variables of x and find where do you hit minus 180. And your calculator may jump between minus 180 and plus 180, but there you know right there is your pot, is your point omega. Yes. So now if 
I think the question is, what's up with the green box? Sort of. I paraphrased it liberally. But how would we find that value? In this point, in this question, you're actually trying to find the gain to get you to that green box. You want to know, and you know it's between 0 and 90, right? Because 0, you're at minus 1, minus 2, and minus 4. And at 90, you're at plus and minus j, 3.74, and somewhere to the left of minus 4. You have three closed loop poles. We now are saying, what if I want a angle of my dominant complex conjugate closed loop poles to be such that the, their angle is 45 degrees? And that corresponds to what percent overshoot? If it was just two poles. 5%. That's a zeta of 0.7. So I have so now what you would do is you would measure this distance. Now you would use your magnitude condition to determine this is more of the design, which is chapter 10, but you now find the distance from minus P1 to the green box. And you could do that with the hypotenuse of a right triangle, so you're using the Pythagorean theorem, or you can use your dividers. I'm, I apologize for those that are listening. I'm actually using some hand signals here and pointing to the screen with my digital divider, my thumb and index finger. It's not as sharp as a real divider, but you'd now find this distance from P1 to the green box, multiply that times the distance from P2 to the green box, and the distance from P3 to the green box, and all of those you're now trying to find, I don't know what color, if I call this L3 and I call this L1 and this is L2, now to find the gain to get me to the green box, my gain formula came out of the magnitude condition, which says this. And in this case, that gives me s plus 1, s plus 2, s plus 4. And since I don't have any zero factors, I don't have to divide by anything. And I'm now trying to evaluate that at s equal the green box. In this case, that's now the L1 length, the L2 length, and the L4 length. Theoretically, you would want to verify that that green box is actually, your sketch is accurate, so you would want to check the angle that that green box is now minus 180, but let's just assume that it's accurate. Now you measure these distances, either physically or algebraically, Multiply them out, and that's the K for the delta. I'm sorry, for the green box. Question? So now, how do you measure those, or how do you compute the distances algebraically? You would now say, oh, I'm roughly at minus 1.2 plus J 1.2, and use that to determine your lengths. So now you're guessing. You're not guessing. You're engineering a solution. So the, the trick is, if there's any trick, is you want your sketch to be somewhat close to the actual. That's why you could check your answer. You could say, is this angle at the green box equal to minus 180? If it is, good. Now you know exactly where that box is located. And you can use that. In this case, let's say that the box, let's say the box is minus 1.2 plus J 1.2. Then what would L1 be? L1 is the distance from, so now L1 is a hypotenuse of a right triangle that has a horizontal length of 1.2 minus 1, or 0.2. It has a vertical distance of 1.2, and now we can find our hypotenuse. So that L1, in this case, you're doing a lot of Pythagorean theorem. You now have 1.2 minus 1 squared plus 
1.2 squared and you compute that. That's L1. L2 is now a similar triangle. Not similar geometrically, but never mind. But now we are going how far? Horizontally to create this hypotenuse formula. If we're at 2 and we want to go to 1.2, how far is that? 0.8, right? I don't have a calculator? All right, I'll give you that one maybe. But now we have 1.2 minus 2 if we wanted to do it that way, squared. Plus, what's the vertical distance from minus P2? 1.2. And that's now L2. That's how you could do it algebraically. That's assuming that the S sub green box is on the root locus and if your sketch is somewhat close you're in good shape because you'll find then that the gain K is somewhere between you could find the gain at the breakaway probably you could find the breakaway point you could find the K at the breakaway you now know you're between the breakaway gain value and 90 you have different ways of checking your work as you progress through this let's say design process what is for completeness what's L3 it was a pole at 4 right minus 4 so now we have 1.2 minus 4 squared plus 1 1.2 squared and if somebody is playing along maybe they've already computed L1 L2 and L3 what's L1 Oh, maybe that was a cell phone somebody had. I thought that was a calculator. I don't have my glasses on. How's that? But you get the idea. This is, what, 0.2 squared plus 1.2 squared. It's a little bit bigger than 1.2. The next one is 0.8 squared, so that's a little bit big. Let's say it's 1.5. So we have 1.2 times 1.5 times, which one's 1.44? The second one, and the third one, what was it? So now we know what K is at the green box. It's now 1.216 times 1.44 times 3.046. Did that answer your question about the green box? <laughs> You're not going to want to open any boxes now after this discussion. Pardon? Not green? Well, Kermit wouldn't be happy with that. Any other questions on this example? But now we've actually moved into chapter 10 a little bit with respect to design. And what we want to do is if we're not happy with this root locus pattern, we need to start thinking about how can we place other poles and zeros on the S-plane to change that root locus structure, to modify it, to get branches where we want those branches. Question? Yes, so the question was, how do these branches behave? They behave beautifully in terms of symmetry. They are exactly symmetric. So whatever is happening above in the positive half plane is happening symmetrically or mirrored in the bottom half. And as soon as this particular pole in the upper half plane reaches the imaginary axis, the one below it is, because these are appearing in complex conjugate pole pairs. So as you crank up to 90, you are hitting J3.7 and minus J3.7 together. So if these were dancing, they would be dancing very smoothly together. Yes? Yes? 
So now what we're doing is we are basically looking at the angles if we wanted to to get us to that green box. That's correct. We would just find the angle from minus P1 to the green box, the angle from P2 to the green box, and the angle from P3 to the green box. Uh, no, you don't know the sum of that is 45. You now have, what's the angle from minus P1 to the green box? If you had to eyeball it, if it's at 1 1.2, minus 1 1.2 plus and minus J1.2, what's the angle from minus P1 to the green box? It's more than 90, isn't it? So I'm talking now about this angle... right there. This I'm calling theta P1. That angle, theta P1, I've now rotated beyond 90. I'm now maybe at 105 for an angle. So that's now 105. That's not 45, is it? What's theta sub P sub 2's angle? That one might be, if it was at if we were at minus 1 plus and minus J1, we would be at 45 degrees from minus P sub 2. But we're a little bit beyond that. We're at minus 1.2 plus and minus J1.2. So this angle theta sub P sub 2 would be a little bit different from 45. And then theta sub P sub 3's angle is less than 45. And we would add those up and hopefully if they equal minus 180, we know we've located our green box on the root locus. So now what I want to do in the infinite amount of time remaining is talk about rule number six because it is actually similar to what we've been talking about. These are the angles of arrival and departure. Let me give you an example. Since now infinity, our time constant, and we only have five of those, our time constant's pretty small. Well, if it's 2%, I was going 1% settling time and giving a what five time constant. Suppose our G of S is now S plus 2 squared plus 2 squared over S squared times S plus 4. And now I want you to be able to very quickly sketch the pole zero pattern. Where are my zeros? Oh, come on. You, you know, I've written it in a factored form to immediately tell you where those zeros are. They're at minus 2 plus and minus J2 by the way that it's factored. I now have two zeros and they're complex conjugate and they're right there. My poles, I have two at the origin and I'm showing them different just so you see that there's two. It's a double pole at the origin and we have a pole at minus four. What's the root locus pattern look like? Can you envision that from this constellation of poles and zeros? Which how many segments of the real axis are there that have been created? How many segments have we cut our bread into? How many... So if I have my real line as a piece of bread and I've cut it, where do I cut it? I cut it wherever I have poles and zeros on the real line. So I should have three segments, right? I have a segment from minus 4 to minus infinity, a segment from the origin to minus 4, and a piece of bread from 0 all the way to plus infinity. I have three real axis segments. Are any of those on the root locus? Are any of those three pieces on the root locus? Are you kidding me? Okay, now, what happens? These 
are going to break away and approach those zeros. What we are asking with this rule number six is what's the angle that these approach or arrive at that zero. If I magnified this up, thank you for being patient. This is now an expanded view of this and the root locus is coming in like this. The angle that I'm interested in is that particular angle, theta sub a. That's now my angle of arrival, theta sub a. Do you see how I'm defining it? Relative to this horizontal line and the root locus that I've sketched is coming in from sort of the upper right and the tangential dashed line is giving me the angle that I need and that would be my angle of arrival. To compute that, what would I do? I would say I have an angle theta sub a here and then I have angles, two angles from there. I have an angle from this guy, that's 90 degrees, and I have this angle. Those have to equal minus 180 and so the only unknown really is theta sub a. I would have theta sub a plus 90 due to the zero then minus two angles from the origin angles, minus this angle at minus four, those sum to minus 180. The only unknown is theta sub a. That's your angle of arrival. We'll pick up at that point on Monday. <laughs>